welcome, welcome to my spooky edition of my digital classroom. Today we're going to be discussing a very interesting subgenre of romantic literature, and that is the gothic. You ready to get started? I think we're ready. Okay, all jokes and rubber theatrics aside, I'm really excited to talk to you guys today about the dark side of romanticism. We are going to be looking at the text On the Pleasure Derived from Objects of Terror with Sir Bertrand, a fragment by, and I want to make sure I get the names right, Anna Letitia Barbald, maiden name Aiken, and her brother John Aiken. So that's a mouthful. And you may have noticed from my previous video, we had a little bit of an accident, but the show must go on. All of my notes are still legible, so let's get right into it. Let's go ahead and begin with setting a foundation of what gothic literature is and how it sets itself apart from romanticism. So we have a couple of videos on romanticism already and what their values were. For gothic literature, you'll need to know that there were some characteristics of this subgenre that really made it stand out, one of which was setting. The setting is often in a medieval or archaic time. There were large intimidating structures such as castles, palaces, mansions, uh, which were isolated and often had fallen into disrepair. Or if they were in perfect condition, they were somehow haunted by this idea of death and decay by having some sort of supernatural presence. The presence of the supernatural is the second characteristic that makes Gothic literature stand out from Romanticism. So that would be the presence or an insinuation of a presence of a ghost or a vampire some kind of monster, a doppelganger, or double. And even if the presence can be explained away with logic, they're the seed of a haunting or some sort of otherworldly presence is already planted in the mind of the reader. The third characteristic is this presence of the uncanny. And what the uncanny is, is a psychological experience where you're finding something unusual in something that is strangely familiar. It's not necessarily mysterious, but it kind of makes you uncomfortable. So think of something kind of like a realistic wax-like figure or a very realistic robot, dolls, things that are human-like but not quite human. Um, Frankenstein's monster, our buddy in the back, is a good example of the uncanny because his creator, Victor Frankenstein, felt as though he was creating a, a pinnacle of mankind, a god among men. He was going to bring all of these pieces together and create this amazing whole. And it wasn't until after the animation of the creature that he looked at it and realized that this is strange, this isn't normal, this isn't okay. He sees all of the pieces of all the different corpses and realizes that he has created a monster. The next characteristic we're gonna talk about is the sublime. And very much like the uncanny, it can be a little difficult to explain, but what it does essentially is it takes the focus that the romantics have on nature and kind of twists it and perverts it a little bit so that you have a darker side of nature. So rather than enjoying a pleasant walk in the countryside or getting lost in the beauty of a single rose, you are to feel very small, very isolated, very powerless in the face of how grand and almost destructive nature can be. So it's like putting your reader on the deck of a ship that is pitching amongst the like crazy storm at sea and you're not sure if you're going to survive but you're enjoying the experience because there's an electrifying feeling of living while you're going through it. That's the sublime. Using terror to create delight and confusion and often it's done through nature. The next one, tone is often very dark and mysterious. Uh, there's always a foreboding sense of evil. You know something bad is going to happen. You just don't know what and you don't know when. The weather and setting are often used to establish tone. And sometimes what is going on with the setting, like weather, can mirror the high emotions of the characters. All right, so this last character we're going to talk about is eroticism. So there's a presence of gothic eroticism. And just like with the sublime, where you take a normal appreciation of something and turning it into something else. The romantics did have eroticism, but it was kind of a courtly love of, um, oh, you're so beautiful, I want to be with you because I care about you, not because our like love is being orchestrated for some kind of advancement. It's because we genuinely love each other. So they had that. In the gothic eroticism, what they did was they took topics that were not okay to talk about in sophisticated society, things like incest, things like necrophilia, and they put it in their stories so that it, it opened up a conversation where they could have it. 
You'll also see this used with same-sex attraction and the swapping of gender roles. So a lot of times women were expected to be weak. They were expected to rely on men for protection. Men were supposed to be these pinnacles of, of masculinity. And so those would get swapped where sometimes you would have a man who just is, is lost in this world. He doesn't know what's going on. He's often confused. He's seeking a way out. And then you have this sexually confident and dominant female who comes in and seduces him and takes advantage of him. It turns a lot of what society thought was okay, twists it or presents different types of relationships that were not okay in society so that they could have a venue of talking about these types of things. That's what art is meant to do anyway. It's meant to explore ideas, but this is just kind of an area where it was a little bit more salacious, a little bit more taboo. And we even see this still existing today in our current media because to this day, creatures like vampires are considered very seductive, very desirable. I think Netflix even has a show where you follow the literal devil Lucifer and he's made to be this sympathetic character who's, you know, very attractive and very seductive and he's often, you know, engaging in seductive situations with a lot of different females and that is a positive attribute for him which would not have been a normal thing to talk about back then. So we kind of see that coming through and that's kind of the gothics influence on our modern day culture. Okay, so with that foundation laid of how to identify gothic literature, we're now gonna direct our attention to the text in question on the pleasure derived from objects of terror. So the first portion of this text is actually the two authors speaking directly to the reader about literary theory. They're talking about why readers are drawn to these types of stories. What about reading things that are negative or frightening is appealing to us. Why do we do this to ourselves when there doesn't seem to be any logical or practical reason as to why we would want to frighten ourselves? And we're going to get into quotes and details in a moment, but essentially what is summarized is that the type of genre has twists and turns that keeps us guessing. Our mind is mentally engaged and we're trying to figure out what's going to happen before it happens. We know bad things are going to come, but we don't know when and we don't know where and we don't know how. So we are kind of pushed forward into this story because we have to know what happens in the end. We want to know how it all wraps up, if it wraps up. In order for a story to frighten you and appall you, you need to have elements of terror and you need to have elements of horror. These are two different terms, they have two different definitions and it's important that you know the difference. Terror is the anxiety, it's the waiting, it's the build up to something scary, it's the suspense. If you are in a sense of terror, you are just really feeling that pressure, that anxiety in your chest, you're concerned, you don't know what's going to happen. Horror, on the other hand, is more about the graphic and the grotesque. It shows you a scene that you're naturally supposed to repel away from. You're like, oh my god, I can't believe that that happened. And when I think about horror, I really think about the Saw movies. And a lot of people can say, oh, it's terror because it's a game. And, it, you know, it's English class. So if you can back up your answer with evidence from the text, that's fine. But the scenes that the people find themselves in, in those movies, is so horrific to me that I really just can't get into the story. There's more horror throughout that series of movies than there is terror. I don't mind a good psychological thriller. I don't mind if I know that there's some kind of monster in the woods or there's some sort of killer on the loose and we're trying to figure out who it is. That's fine with me. But being constantly bombarded with gore is not my cup of tea. So those are the two differences of those terms. Okay, now looking into the text, I'm going to share with you a couple of the quotes that stood out to me in the first portion before we get to Sir Bertrand, the fragment, um, in case I were going to be doing the double entry journal. So the first thing that stood out to me was this comparison of gothic lit text with those with scenes of misery. So the idea that we can explain why we like sad stories and it's because people are naturally empathetic and want to help other people and so to read stories that have these sad scenes kind of make us feel good about ourselves because we can empathize with that character and it feels good as a human to do that, to empathize with others. But the apparent delight with which we dwell on objects of pure terror where our moral feelings are not in the least concerned and no passion seems to be excited but the depressing one of fear is a paradox of the heart much more difficult of solution so there's no real reason to want to be terrorized and yet we do as a, as a as a population we as humans are really interested in these items of pure terror the next quote that stood out to me 
the greediness with which the tales of ghosts and goblins, of murders, earthquakes, fires, shipwrecks, and all the most terrible disasters attending human life are devoured by every ear must have been generally remarked. So the idea that it's obvious that we're interested in these stories, you can just see on a daily occurrence all the people who are really interested in these types of atrocities. Why is that? Why is it that in all of these ancient texts, because now we have a series of allusions to tragedy and they, they mention um, Shakespeare's Hamlet, Macbeth, Richard, um, and then you go into the ancient Greek and Roman tragedians. And so you're going to have a lot of allusions to Greek and Roman mythological creatures on the next page. Mythological creatures such as the Shades of the Dead, the Furies, and other fabulous inhabitants of the Infernal Regions. The Infernal Regions are like Hades. So all of these different monsters and creatures that have kind of existed since the beginning of mankind storytelling. And so then we start to get our first answer, and the first answer is the pain of suspense and the irresistible desire of satisfying curiosity when once raised for our eagerness to go quite through an adventure though we suffer actual pain during the whole course of it, we rather choose to suffer the smart pang of a violent emotion than the uneasy craving of an unsatisfied desire. So that's saying like, okay, well maybe it's our curiosity. We have to finish it because we're curious, we want to know. But they continue writing, so it's not the final answer. It seems to be, you know, it's missing something. So they continue on talking about it, theorizing about it. We get presented a new idea in the sentence, a strange and unexpected event awakens the mind and keeps it on its stretch and where the agency of invisible beings is introduced of forms unseen and mightier far than we. Our imagination darting forth explores with rapture the new world which is laid open to its view and rejoices in the expansion of its powers, passion and fancy cooperating elevate the soul to its highest pitch and the pain of terror is lost in amazement. So that sounds really cool that these stories open up a whole new world that we're able to mentally explore and think about and it gives us all these new possibilities that you wouldn't expect and that is enjoyable so it's different than a novel that just tells you how the world is this opens up all of these different ideas to you know okay maybe this story is about ghosts but that leads you to wonder about zombies you know things like that it opens up a whole new possibility of what happens after death because Unless you, you know, are a very religious person and you have a substantial amount of faith, there's no answer to that question that can be backed up with any kind of evidence. So we always have this, as a, as a human culture, have this idea of wondering what happens and all of the different ways that something bad could happen or all of the different monsters that could exist in this other realm. So then the author goes on to talk about more illusions. We have the Arabian Nights, the Castle of Otrato, Ferdinand, Count Fathom, and then they present a fragment. And so what they're saying is here, we're gonna give you an example that illustrates all of our points and that will prove why people are interested in these types of stories. And so you get the little story of Sir Bertrand, which is not a complete story. It can be a little frustrating reading it. I was a little frustrated because you want more. And that's, that just illustrates that desire to finish the story. The fragment is intentionally an example of this genre. So things are going to be a little bit more obvious and maybe a little bit more heavy handed than if it were an actual story where the author might want to hide more and give away more and foreshadow more. They were presenting a lot of elements of gothic literature in a very short amount of space. And so they're all kind of jam packed in there and it kind of takes away a little bit but it it serves its purpose it's a very good example so now we're going to get into Sir Bertrand and his experience okay so Sir Bertrand is a literal knight which already puts us in a medieval or archaic time period and he's on some adventure but we don't know what he says in the first line after this adventure Sir Bertrand turned his steed towards the woods hoping to cross these dreary moors before the curfew okay so that puts him on a little bit of a time crunch. It makes it seem like he has to get where he's going in a certain amount of time. We don't know what he has been doing. Um, but then he gets lost. He gets, you know, effectively lost. He has no idea where he's going. The fact that he is in a dreary moors. Um, he can't see anything around him except for the brown heath, which is an area of uncultivated land. So it's just overgrown. Um... He has no way to direct his course, he can't see, and when night overtakes him, the moon is covered by clouds, not giving him a, a good, clear view. The clouds are also lowering the sky, so there aren't any stars. He can't even use the stars to find his way. Um, and then 
he's just surrounded by this desolate waste. So we've got the isolated setting. The setting is tying to the character who's lost. He can't find his way. There's literally no light, no guidance. And he dreaded moving from the ground he stood on for fear of unknown pits and bogs. So we know that the setting itself is also a form of danger, that there could be some sort of supernatural element at play, but the literal setting is also very dangerous. And alighting from his horse in despair, he threw himself on the ground. That line is kind of where I characterize Sir Bertrand. He's a knight, but he's not behaving in a very knightly fashion. So we're gonna just put a pin in that. And then all of a sudden, a sullen toll of a distant bell struck his ear. This is the first ringing of the bell, and then a dim and twinkling light appears. So that light kind of represents hope. It represents the guidance that he needed, and he just starts following the light. That's kind of his entire plan throughout the rest of the story is he follows the light. If the light disappears, he just kind of stops or he tries to go backwards. He never has any forward movement unless that light is present, which again, I think characterizes him in a negative way. Um, he then comes to a old castle that is falling apart. And then I really liked the line, the injuries of time were strongly marked on everything about it. That sounds so cool and it's such a great way to say that every element of this castle has been injured in some way through time. It's not safe. So we've moved from one unsafe setting in the moors to another unsafe setting, the castle. It describes the castle and how it was you know, torn apart, the roof in various places was fallen in, the battlements were half demolished, and the windows broken and dismantled. A drawbridge with a ruinous gateway at each end led to the court before the building. He entered and instantly the light which proceeded from a window in one of the turrets glided along and vanished. This idea of things appearing and disappearing is really common in gothic literature and it also illustrates that he had hope, he had guidance, and then it disappears. That is an ongoing theme for this character throughout the text. That light disappearing is his purpose, it's his forward motion, it's what keeps him going in that direction. So perhaps we could say that that light represents the human curiosity and our desire to get to the end and we want to follow that light even if we're in a really scary situation if we're reading a very scary story we are propelled to follow that light in the same way that sir bertrand is propelled to follow that light because he doesn't have any other option in his mind okay so as I was reading through this text, I was doing a lot of research and I didn't find a whole lot out there, but I did find a lot of information about Gothic literature. And one thing that I did find was the structure of the Gothic. And it was presented by someone on their personal blog. So that could be debated whether or not these things are fit into a story, whatever the case may be. But I wanted to use it as an example, just to see how much of Sir Bertrand fit in with the typical structure of a Gothic. And I didn't get very far, obviously, because we don't have a completed story, but it starts with a character that is valued or not valued. And I made the argument that Sir Bertrand being a knight meant that he was valued. He's at least valued by his community. To become a knight, you had to go through a series of trainings. You had to be blessed by the church and you were, you know, kept up with. Like people wanted to make sure that you were doing knightly things and you had like a reputation to protect. So I feel like he was valued in his society because of his title. He's off an adventure, he gets lost, which leads to an under underestimated talent causes an emotional issue to form. And I said that his emotional issue is fear and dread. We see that he falls victim to dread very early on where he flings himself from his horse and lays on the ground because he doesn't know what to do. The second part of the Gothic interpretation was the incidental or accidental accomplishment. And I don't think that he necessarily accomplishes anything. So it's more of an incidental, he draws the attention of the light. And that is what propels his story forward. Number three, encounter with the monster, which is a symbol of his emotional issue. I said that the house or the light is the symbol of the monster because we don't really know if the light is a good thing or a bad thing. It could be leading him to his demise like bait, or it could be, you know, a representation of his faith and his hope and things getting better if he just follows his path. It can mean a number of different things, but I'm equating the house and the light as the monster because he has more issues getting through the house than he does at the end of the story. Moving forward, act two, the sincere crash or mistake. 
pride represents an irresistible challenge. And I found a quote in the text that fits with that pretty smoothly. Um, so he goes up to the house and he knocks on the door three times. Nothing happens. He was a while motionless. Then terror impelled him to make some hasty steps toward his steed. But shame stopped his flight and urged by honor and a resistless desire of finishing the adventure, he returned to the porch and working up his soul to a full steadiness of resolution, he drew forth his sword with one hand and with the other lifted up the latch of the gate. So we see a, a moment of clarity for Sir Bertrand. He had the opportunity to leave, possibly be safe, you know, leave this castle behind in its mysterious light. But he has this duty, this honor, this pride, part of being a knight, that he has to finish the adventure. Very similarly with the reader who's reading a scary story might get to a point where like, oh, I want to put this book down. But you want to know what happens. And so you're pushed through just like Sir Bertrand. So he goes into the castle. He can't see anything at first. Uh, the door slams shut behind him, even though it was very difficult to open. And so then he's just kind of trapped. There's a clear element of the supernatural now. We know that the light is not attached to any kind of mechanical being like a lighthouse, and it's not attached to a necessarily a person that we can confirm or deny because it appears and disappears and it floats on its own. So we now have our surefire set of supernatural presence and the door slamming shut behind him lets you know that the house is kind of alive. Cue monster house. Sir Bertrand's blood was chilled. He turned back to find the door, and it was long ere his trembling hands could seize it, but his utmost strength could not open it. After several ineffectual attempts, he looked behind him and beheld across a hall, upon a large staircase, a pale bluish flame, which cast a dismal gleam of light around. So again, he tried, he stayed put, and he tried to go backwards until that light reappeared, and then he was willing to move forward again. So he goes towards the light, the light moves away. He goes towards the light, the light moves away. And he, it, he moves himself through the house in this way. He gets to the staircase and this line was just, it was great. A dead cold hand met his left hand and firmly grasped it, drawing him forcibly forwards. He endeavored to disengage himself, but could not. He made blow with his sword and instantly a loud shriek pierced his ears and the dead hand was left powerless in his, he dropped it and rush forward with a desperate valor. Oh God. So we've now encountered some sort of monster. We didn't get to see what it was, but he said it was a dead cold hand that grabbed him and pulled him forward up the stairs. So at that point you might think, hmm, the house in general wants me to go deeper into it. Maybe this isn't a good idea. Maybe I am in some significant danger, but he rushed forward with a desperate valor. He's still moving forward, despite the fact there's a significant amount of evidence that says this is not a good thing for you. We have the continuing appearing and disappearing. The bell has chimed two more times since the first one. It's beginning to get a little bit more unrealistic and a lot more supernatural. The danger of uncertain footing on the staircase and in the house continues this idea of the setting being like a character that presents its own challenges. So he's not necessarily battling a dragon, but the setting serves as a dragon and it is something that keeps him on his toes for fear that he will fall. He gets to a point with intricate winding passages, um, just large enough to admit a person upon his hands and knees. That's very creepy. A faint glimmering of light served to show the nature of the place. Sir Bertrand entered a, a deep hollow groan resounded from a distance through the vault. He went forwards and proceeding beyond the first turning discerned the same blue flame which had before conducted him and so he followed it. The vault at length suddenly opened into a lofty gallery yeah. in the midst of which a figure appeared completely armed with a terrible frown and a menacing gesture and brandishing a sword in his hand. Sir Bertrand undauntedly sprung forward and aiming a fierce blow at the figure it instantly vanished, letting fall a massy iron key. I believe, in my interpretation of this text, is that Sir Bertrand came to be face to face with himself. Because the idea of doubles and doppelgangers is really common in Gothic literature. We don't get a clear description of the other figure, but we know that he's frowning, he's threatening, and he's holding a sword. Who else in the story is holding a sword? And he goes to attack it, and it disappears. So it seems as though the only times that Sir Bertrand is willing to push forward is when it's kind of a 
fight or flight situation. Is that really bravery or is that just a survival instinct? Something to consider because again, I feel as though he does not present himself in a very knightly way as he continues throughout the story. The flame now rested upon a pair of ample folding doors at the end of the gallery. Sir Bertrand went up to it and applied the key to a brazen lock. With difficulty, he turned the bolt. Instantly, the doors flew open and discovered a large apartment, at the end of which was a coffin rested upon a bier with a taper burning on each side of it. So we're seeing another door that didn't want to open. So it's like he is fighting. He's pushing forward to reach what could very well be his demise. And then we open into a door with a casket in it with candles lit on both sides. What does that remind you of? Vampires. Okay. So he's looking into the apartment and along the room on both sides were gigantic statues of black marble attired in the Moorish habits and holding enormous sabers in their right hands. So as we continue with the structure of the Gothic, the monstrosity is unveiled. And so that's kind of what happens in this room is the monstrosity is unveiled. Uh, and they are forced to battle and win a battle, but their own monstrous nature is revealed. That is kind of where the structure kind of falls apart because our story just kind of ends. So let's continue on. Each of them reared his arms and advanced one leg forward as the knight entered. At the same moment, the lid of the coffin flew open and the bell tolled a fourth time. The flame still glided forward and Sir Bertrand resolutely followed till he arrived within six paces of the coffin. Six paces, six feet under. Hmm. Suddenly, a lady in a shroud and a black veil rose up in it and stretched out her arms toward him. At the same time, the statues clashed their sabers and advanced. Sir Bertrand flew to the lady and clasped her in his arms. She threw up her veil and kissed his lips, and instantly the whole building shook as with an earthquake and was fell asunder with a horrible crash. Sounds like a really bad ending, right? Nope. Sir Bertrand was thrown into a sudden trance and upon recovering found himself seated on a velvet sofa in the most magnificent room he had ever seen, lighted with innumerable tapers and lustrous of pure crystal. A sumptuous banquet was set in the middle, the doors opening to soft music. A lady of incomparable beauty attired with amazing splendor entered, surrounded by a troop of gay nymphs, far more fair than the graces, which are minor Greek goddesses. She advanced on the night and falling on her knees, thanked him as her deliverer and the nymphs placed a garland of laurel on his head and the lady led him by the hand to the banquet and sat beside him. The nymphs placed themselves at the table and a numerous train of servants entering served up the feast, delicious music playing all the time. Sir Bertrand could not speak for astonishment. He could only return their honors with courteous looks and gestures. After the banquet was finished, all retired, but the lady who leading back the knight to the sofa addressed him in these words. In fragment. I feel like it's really difficult to believe that this is a happy ending because gothic literature doesn't often have happy endings and it still ends on a pretty sinister note. This woman who is clearly in charge, she's the one, you know, moving about and she's commanding the nymphs and the servants and she's kind of like master of the castle, but he can't speak because he's astonished and then when she's about to speak, the fragment ends so there are no voices this is all narrated there are no character voices at all and we don't get a whole lot of looks into any of the characters minds apart from sir bertrand being afraid and continuing on anyway it's a lot of things to think about i think that this last bit is like number three departure from society regret triggers and the person the hero escapes or or is removed from society I think that it's possible that this is an example of another world and he has left the real world as we know it and he's not going to be able to return. Perhaps he had the issue like the Cowardly Lion where he wasn't a very good knight. He was often, you know, afraid or when he did respond, he did it in kind of a flaily, panicky survival fashion. And so he was not as well respected as other knights. And so he went off on his own adventure trying to prove himself. Who knows? There's a lot of unanswered questions because it's just a fragment. I'd be really interested to know your thoughts, so do leave them in the comments down below. Alright, so to wrap up, I want to start with our main character, Sir Bertrand. I don't want to spend too much time picking on him because I feel like I've already made it pretty clear that I don't like him very much as a character. He's not a believable hero. He's kind of a broken knight. 
Uh, from the beginning, he seems completely inadequate and incapable of handling a situation. He gets lost while he's on one adventure that we don't know anything about. Rather than maybe making camp and just kind of waiting until dawn and trying to get his bearings and figure out what he's going to do, he just sort of gives up. He flings himself from his horse. He lays on the ground. He, he doesn't know what to do. He can't find his way, so he gives up. He seems like the type of character who always wants to take the easy way out, and I think that's partially why he only moves forward when the light presents itself. He does not have any internal gumption that pushes him forward. He has more of a shame that keeps him moving, like when he's about to leave and go back to his horse, but he's like, I have to finish this adventure. It's more of a sense of shame rather than pride. It, it seems like he has to do it, like he's obligated to do it, not like he's happy to do it. I don't really think that he's very brave. I don't think that he is very... He doesn't incite a lot of confidence in him. Like, if he were the one who was coming to rescue you from the tallest tower, I'm not entirely sure if you would be putting a lot of money on Sir Bertrand being successful. And he seems kind of autopiloted. Um, knights are expected to have depth and clear moral ethics where he has no internal or external monologue, which is a writer's choice, so we don't get to see in his head. He doesn't speak out loud. But I feel like that also creates a, an idea that he's a little bit hollow. Unless someone is giving him a very clear path, he doesn't know what to do. And that's kind of what the light offers him. It gives him a path. So this is just him as a knight, as a main character, not as a sample of what gothic literature could be. We do see him with the flip gender roles where he is kind of prone to emotion and he seems very lost and he's he needs his own rescuer. So that serves its purpose. Thinking about the different enemies that he encounters, I definitely think that setting is a good en enemy. It's an enemy from the beginning with the setting of the Moors and the Dark Knight. The dead hand on the stair, it shrieks when its hand is cut off, so we know that there's some kind of physical being connected to it. It's not just a floating hand. Um, Bertrand drops the hand and continues, so he doesn't even really stop to consider has that monster gone further up into the stairs? Like, he, he rushes forward without really thinking. The character double, um, where we see the frowning, threatening gesture and a sword, the fight isn't really necessary, even though Sir Bertrand kind of, like, lunges forward and attacks this being because that being, upon being attacked, just disappears. So, again, there's no real... All of the enemies kind of fall away from him very quickly, and it kind of seems like it's just buttering him up. It's like, oh, look how brave you are. Oh, look how strong you are. Keep moving forward. The giant black marble statues with sabers in the coffin room, again, they don't have to fight. Like, he doesn't have to encounter these beings. They seem kind of like maybe watchdogs for the being that's in the coffin. Um, they move only after Bertrand enters the room. They're a little bit more of an intimidating factor than a functional factor because as soon as the light gets him within six paces of the casket, he just runs for the casket and the statues don't do anything. It's like all of a sudden they fade into a background. And it could be that they were perhaps intentional to where, like, you can't go left, you can't go right. The only place that you really can go is to the coffin. So thinking about the woman in the coffin, if she needed to be rescued, not entirely sure what Bertrand's plan was after running to the coffin. So if she were like the damsel in the distress that does appear in Gothic literature, what? once you've gone to the coffin and gotten into this woman's arms, what's going on with the two statues? I mean, like, it's, it'd be real easy for them to just get rid of him. He didn't have an exit strategy. He didn't have a plan. Is this woman also a villain? She could be a vampire. She could be a witch. She could be some sort of minor goddess like Cersei, who's able to use magic to make men believe things that she wants them to believe. We don't know. But we know that she sits up in the coffin of her own accord. She does not need to be awoken from some sort of sleep or given some sort of medicine or, or anything like that. She comes up of her own accord. And once he's in six paces, she opens her arms to him and he runs to her. So she invites him into her space. So we're seeing that's a little bit different for women um, who would need to be the damsel in distress. So she offers what could be um, safety, like how a mother will open her arms to her child. So Bertrand's kind of like a child in this scene, running to the embrace of this woman who's kind of like a mother figure in this to save him from all of the nightmares around him. The woman lifts her own veil and she kisses him. So she's the, the aggressor in that, makes her maybe sexually dominant, that, that gothic eroticism. 
And she's not necessarily feminine in terms of the medieval expectations of what women should have done, because this is an archaic medieval setting. It all kind of points to her being the mastermind and literally drawing forth her prey to come directly to her. She's got breakfast in bed. Like, I don't believe that that final scene is the ending where she's like, oh, thank you for saving me. You're so wonderful. For all we know, he's been put into some sort of trance and he stayed there. He stayed in the trance and she's going to eat him or whatever she wants to do with him because she's creepy. If you're thinking about women in gothic lit, um, the protagonist of the classic gothic heroine is often persecuted, not sure where she is. She needs rescue. She's vulnerable, often young women. They fall victim to supernatural forces because they are weaker or more open to corruption, like going mad. They are wide-eyed and innocent, and their innocence is shattered throughout the process. They can be portrayed as sexual and dominant, but and thus a threat to men because that bucks society's expectations. Uh, they are often damsels in distress to either tyrannical men or circumstances, maybe their fear, perhaps they suffer from some sort of ailment, and they are often tied with imprisonment and isolation. So she does have the isolation, possibly imprisonment, perhaps she's trapped in, her spirit might be trapped in this house, and she has to, like one of those creepy lantern fish, bring her victims to her. The idea of him being lost in the moors and the heath ties back to Macbeth and the three sisters, the weird sisters or the um, wayward sisters. And those are the three witches that kind of give Macbeth a look into his future. The wayward sisters are basically a reform of the fates. And the fates were the three Greek minor goddesses that dealt with mortals and their lifespans. So we had Clotho who spun the thread Laxis who dispensed it and Atropos who cut it and I might be saying all of their names wrong but that's just something to think about. There's also Hecate the Greek goddess who had three faces who was the maiden the mother and the crone representing the cycle of life past present and future phases in women's lives. Um, and then the final thing that I wanted to bring out is the Furies who are brought up in the first part of this text by our authors. I had to look up who they were and they are the crones so female deities from the underworld who focus on vengeance and they are three maiden goddesses electo punisher of moral crimes megara punisher of infidelity oath breakers and theft hercules and tisephone punisher of murderers so we have this one woman who opens her who looks like she's a damsel in distress and a maiden she opens her arms like a mother she kisses this man as though they, she is a lover of his. And then the, the nymphs who come in, nymphs were nature goddesses. And they were often not positive interactions with mortals. They would do bad things to mortals for fun. So that to me is a little bit of foreshadowing. The fact that the nymphs are there because they seem to be lesser goddesses who have been drawn to the power of a stronger goddess perhaps hecate or a version of hecate who knows i mean this is all just literary theory this is all just chatting about a fragment that's meant to illustrate the elements of gothic literature and to illustrate why readers are so entranced by these stories i had so much fun picking this story apart and i think i put more notes on this text than any of the others so far. It was a really enjoyable read. I hope that you enjoyed it. I'm open to, you know, furthering this conversation. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, please leave them in the comment section below. I will leave links to the sources where I went to find information to try to get some stuff together that way it can help you too. And yeah, thanks so much for showing up. I'll see you on the next one.